It's still Christmas. I don't know if you know that, but it is still Christmas. We're still singing Christmas songs in church, and it is going to be Christmas until the 2nd of February. Now, because it's still Christmas, I actually want to talk a little bit about the Christmas story. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. Because, you know, the Muslims, they complain that we come here and we don't talk about our own faith. But actually, if they bothered to watch the videos properly, they'd realize that we talk about our faith all the time. So, the, the, the passage I want to talk about is Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 26. Okay? Still Christmas, we're still talking about Christmas. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, what we see here, brothers and sisters, that God is working through real people. He's working through the Virgin Mary, and he's working through families. I'm of the opinion, I'm of the opinion that Christ's relationship to the house of David is through adoption. Now, I recognize that that is a minority opinion. Lots of Christians argue that Mary was also a descendant of David. Um, she was certainly uh, a relative to Aaron, but I believe that there's nothing wrong with adoption. It's not some second class inheritance. It is equal to being born of blood. And so because Joseph was of the house of David and Joseph adopted our Lord Jesus Christ as his child, then Jesus was also of the house of David. And Mary at this time was a virgin. She had never been married before. She had no relations with other people. Amongst Christians, there is discussion a about whether she continued as a virgin and also about whether Joseph was an elderly man who had been married before and had children to uh, his previous marriage. The angel came unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. The Virgin Mary had been chosen by God to be his vessel, to be the ark by which he entered into the world. God had chosen Mary to be his chosen instrument. And God, through his angel, says to Mary that she is favored. Now, if God speaks through his angel to Mary in such high esteem, Christians should be very weary of speaking to Mary in less than high esteem. And sadly, because of the weariness or the proximity that many Protestant Christians feel about the closeness that Catholics have to Mary, they almost, in a way, speak almost flippantly about Mary. And that's not appropriate. If you are a Protestant and you want to be biblical, then honor Mary as the Bible honors Mary. And he came unto her and said, Hail thou art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation might this be. This goes back to the fact that when you look at biblical angels, biblical angels are not the kind of portraits that you see in churches. They're not hippies coming in long dressing gowns looking all friendly. Go and read an Old Testament description of an angel. It's terrifying. Wheels and eyes in all directions and wings and flames and bolts of lightning. These are not things that are not scary. And so she was greatly troubled because the angel that appeared to her looked terrifying. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. So Mary has found pleasure in God's eyes. And this is why we should honour Mary. Honour, I stay. Because God has honoured Mary. It goes on to say, 
And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God shall give him to him the throne of his father David. The Holy Spirit, sorry, it goes on. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom shall be, there shall be no end. So the Gospels are saying that Jesus inherits the throne of David. This is why in Psalm 110, David says, Yahweh says to my Adonai, sit at my right hand until I have placed your enemies at your feet as a footstool. So in other words, Christ is fulfilling all those prophecies in the Old Testament of being the king in the line of David that reigns forever. There are prophecies about the Messiah reigning forever and Christ embodies those prophecies. For he is the king of the Jews. His kingdom has gone out from Jerusalem and he has reigned in the midst of his enemies. The church exists amongst those who persecute her. We proclaim Christ as king in countries that hate our king. We live in Christ's kingdom, though there are those that wish to destroy that kingdom. And Christ is the, the, the one who inherits the throne of David. He is the one who reigns over the house of Jacob. Israel is ruled by Christ. They have no other king. There are Jews today who call Jesus king. Jews don't call others their king. They don't call, they see Yahweh as their king. But there are Jews that call Jesus king. They aren't, they aren't calling Prince Charles their king or Allah their king. They're calling Jesus their king. It goes on. And Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Now notice, this is exactly the same kind of question that was asked by Zacharias. By Zacharias, when he had the annunciation of John the Baptist given to him. But clearly the intention of the question is different from the previous verses because of the response of the angel. For the angel answered, not with a discipline, i.e. you shall be silent until these things occur. How dare you doubt what I have to say? He says, the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. Wherefore also the holy thing which is begotten shall be called the Son of God. Now at the council of Chalcedon, where 500 bishops attended, and at the Council of Ephesus, two formulas that are complementary to one another explained how Christ is God and man. It's stated clearly at the Council of Ephesus that Christ is both fully God and fully man. This was the teaching of Pope, um, oh, what's his name? It'll, it's, it'll come to me once I stop filming, Chris, 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 Chrysorus or something like that, um, of Alexandria, the Pope of Alexandria, who taught in response to the, uh, the incorrect teachings of Nestorius of Constantinople, that Christ was both fully God and fully man, and that he was God at the time of his conception. And that is why at the Council of Ephesus, they declared Mary to be the Theotokos, the God-bearer. Why? Because Nestorius taught that Jesus Christ was just a man and that at some later point, the divine Logos possessed that man like a demon possessing a soul. And the, the Pope of Alexandria argued to Nestorius, look, if that's true, then Mary was not the mother of God. 
that he was that she wasn't the god bearer and so the whole argument at the council of ephesus was what was mary's relation to christ's divinity and that's why she receives the title theotokos now in response to nestorius a presbyter of the church of alexandria called eotuka eoticus taught the opposite error because the quickest way that you can fall into error as a Christian is to go from one extreme to the other extreme. And lots of Christians fall into this error, this kind of error today. Eutychius taught that the divinity of Je the humanity of Jesus was dissolved in the divinity of Jesus, dissolved, vanished in the, the divinity of Jesus. So in other words, he was God but his man had dissolved into it. Like if I put a drop of oil into the ocean, well, it's still going to be the ocean in every sense of the word. Sensually, it will be an ocean. You won't notice the drop of oil. Flavian of Constantinople condemned Eutychius. And in the debate between the Pope of Alexandria and the Pope of Rome, did you know that? Did you know that Christians have more than one Pope? Pope Leo wrote an argument that, of Rome, wrote an argument in his Tome of Leo that to the Pope of Alexandria sounded a lot like Nestorius. And so it was rejected. And so the, counts, the church in Alexandria stuck to the formula of F, the first council of Ephesus. But at the Council of Chalcedon, a complementary formula to that which was established at the Council of Ephesus was given. It is that, and it reaches right back to the Council of Nicaea that spoke about the hypostatic union of the Son with the Father. And it says that Christ has a hypostatic union with us in our humanity on account of Mary and has a hypostatic union with the divinity because of the union with the essence of the Father. And that's what we're here being described. The Holy Spirit in his working upon the flesh of Mary knits the humanity and the divinity of the person of Jesus Christ together. So that where Christ displays those things that we understand to be divine, it comes from his divinity. And where he displays those things that account to us as being human, it is on account of his humanity. And this is what this doctrine is building on it's building on this passage that christ shall be called the son of god because the holy spirit united that divinity to a true humanity the angel goes on and behold elizabeth thy kinswoman she also hath conceived a son in her old age and this is the sixth month to her that was that was called barren so in other words the angel is saying that if God can do this for Elizabeth, why can he not do this for you? If a barren woman can have a child, why then can you not bear the Son of God? And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed her. Now, brothers and sisters, when God gives you a calling in your life, you must answer like Mary. You must inquire, as Mary inquired, how, Lord, may I do such a thing? And you must explore, as Mary explored, what it is God wants you to do through discernment, through the process of studying the faith, studying yourself, studying your circumstances to hear what it is that God wants you to do with your life. 
I've undergone a similar process in my life and that's why I am a committed evangelist evangelizing Muslims because I believe that is what God has called me to do and you must answer as Mary answered behold the handmaid of the Lord be it unto me according to thy word in other words we must search out in our lives that thing that God calls us to do and we must pursue it in faith submitting to the will of God any questions okay I want to I want to finish by pointing out the next verses 39 to 45 and Mary arose in these days and went into the hill country in haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth and it came to pass when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary the babe leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit this verse shows you that life exists in the womb John the baby leapt at the sound of Mary's voice because of the connection by the work of the Holy Spirit at the sound of Mary's voice the mother of his Lord and Mary lifted her voice up her voice with a loud cry and said blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb notice how Elizabeth honors Mary notice that the scriptures say that Mary is blessed and blessed is the fruit of thy womb so let us stop speaking flippantly of Mary and let us give her her due honor and whence is this to me listen to the next bit that the mother of my Lord should come unto me Elizabeth has said that Mary is the mother of her Lord scripture is saying that Mary is the mother of God not in the sense of being the mother of the Father or the mother of the Holy Spirit or as being the originator of divinity but in saying that the baby inside her womb is divine and Mary is the mother of that person Jesus Christ and so it is honorable to give her her titles as scripture gives her her titles behold when the voice of thy salutation came into mine ears the babe leapt in my womb for joy and blessed is she that believed for thy there shall be the fulfillment of the things which have been spoken to her from her Lord when you trust the promises of God and you see them fulfilled in your life as many Christians do count them as your blessings remember what the Lord has done for you and let those blessings be the memorial stones that reinforce and strengthen you in your walk in vocation thank you very much for listening and we'll do a bit more of the christmas story next sunday because it's still christmas merry christmas